So, so Richard is, is, is one of the, the early, early people within my, my group and, and one of the earliest one who, who has been joining. His main subject is laser driven, elect or has been laser driven electron acceleration for a very long time. He has been uh, very active in, in understanding the, the dynamics of laser-driven electron acceleration with a special emphasis on also understanding radiation as a way to, to measure the dynamics of electrons because the, the electrons within the accelerators that Richard is studying usually uh, move on the femtosecond and Submicron scale. So that's really small, that's really short, and there are no standard techniques to actually measure that motion on these scales, both from the spatial and temporal resolution. Usually, the temporal and spatial resolution basically comes usually from the laser parameters. So if you have a laser impinging on a gas, they usually have a focal spot of, of a few micron max and so you really focus them down to a very small spot five micron ten micron something like that and uh, the 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 duration of these laser pulses is usually 30 femtoseconds so very short um and richard has been with the team for a long time working on all these things and especially working very closely to the experimental team to the experimental efforts at HCDR, helping to bring the code where it is today. And that's one of the things that he's going to be talking about. One of our main uh, production call codes called Pick and GPU, which is now uh, 11 years old, um, almost 12 years old. Initially, uh, um, the initial uh, uh, version was by Heiko Burau, who was a student from school writing the first version in six weeks. And this is how these projects start. And this is how all these projects usually start. And then we kept it and, and drove it forward. And Richard was one of the main and has been one of the main developers and, and pushers for this. And today he's going to give you a bit of an introduction on that code, how it works. In structure, it's rather similar to maybe something for the for the systems biology people to an SPH code or something like that. Um, so, so it's a highly parallelizable code. It's complicated in the sense compared to a standard fluid or, or FEM code that it has an additional data domain called particles. And one of the nifty tricks you really have to take care about if you do HPC with this is consider data locality. So you're going to say probably something on data locality in this code as well, because particles are moving. That's the damn problem here. Uh, they should be moving, by the way. That's the physics part. So it's, it's good that they're moving. It's just bad to, to, to orchestrate this. Yeah, and I'm very happy that you're here today, Richard. Unfortunately, since, yeah, I, I know all this stuff, so, so I'll, I'll unfortunately if go somewhere later else. Later on, there are questions, just ask him. Exactly, you can, you can, I can, I can pretend I understand anything on that. Um, yeah, for now, thank you very much again. Um, and as always, even if I'm not here, and I know I can, I can count on you, make a lively discussion, go in and try to understand what Richard is doing, and Richard will do his best to, un to answer your questions. So thanks for coming. Thanks for the introduction. So as Michael already said, I'm going to give you a brief introduction into uh, our main working house, Pick on GPU. Uh, it's a highly parallel 3D 3D, three-dimensional, three-velocity particle and cell code. Um, I'll try to give an introduction. It would have been better to have this talk before Brian's talk a couple of weeks ago. And there are going to be some follow-up talks later on discussing details of, for example, the field solver algorithms, um, which will be done by Klaus Steiniger. Um, so is anybody watching this right now? Is somebody connected to you? Because I share my screen on this computer, and what you see is just a live stream. Um, but Neither one shows me whether somebody is attending or has questions from the outside audience. 
So if one of you could log into this uh, link, it would be great if the updated link is already available. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, 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 Benny. Uh, we, we are visiting from uh, from the new Zoom link. The first link provided by um, uh, Philip was wrong. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. But if I can hear it, it's fine. Then just ask the questions in between because on neither screen I see what is happening. We have yeah, participants. Uh, six. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So let's start. Um, come on. Uh, so basic introduction to plasma physics. Um, so plasma physics covers a wide range of physical phenomena. On the one hand side, so on the left hand side, you've got this micrometer, even nanometer scale laser plasma accelerators. Michael spoke about a couple of minutes ago. Um, that's what we develop experimentally at HZDR and which we mainly simulate using pick on GPU. But of course, plasma physics also space, uh, plays a role on much larger scales like the aurora on a kilometer size scale, the sun or supernova remnants, as you can see here, the Crab Nebula, um, on a much larger spatial scale. And this has also been simulated using PIC on GPU, as I will show you in the end of this talk. Um, so the main equation that governs this plasma dynamics is the Flasov Maxwell system of equation. Um, and so what you see right here in this part right is a distribution function and this distribution function simply describes how our particles are distributed in 6D phase space so in spatial position and in momentum and since 6D is a bit hard to plot uh, on a slide uh, this is just reduced to 1D one dimension one momentum and it could look like this but since we need derivatives of that usually you handle this with continuous functions um, but just as a side mark, so this part right here describes uh, is a continuity equation, so you don't lose particles. Here you've got the Lorentz force acting, then the rest is just the Maxwell equation. And I just want to point out two uh, parts right here. Oh, uh, this is, is this thing else for this? Okay, so how can I? Does anybody know I can do this full screen again? <laughs> Click on I have to look at that. Um, so the, the, these are the time evolution parts. So if we at one point have a, a valid solution of the Maxwell's equation with the time dependent equations, you can update these fields. Okay. Um, so there are different ways of numerical simulating a plasma. Uh, one approach would be to consider every single particle. Um, and compute the forces interacting between all particles. This is done by so-called molecular dynamics codes. Uh, of course, this is highly expensive since you have a n squared contribution between all particles. And the main issue is that, of course, you can use Coulomb's law to determine the force between the particles if they are charged. However, Coulomb's law is only applied with the non-relativistic particles. So Molecular dynamics uh, codes have problems for relativistic particles and are limited to, I think the record right now is a billion particles for a very determined system, um, but usually it's, it's below a million particles. Um, another common approach for numerical simulations of plasma is MHD, magnetohydrodynamics, where you describe your dynamic based on average values. So for example, in this case, we've got a mean momentum or mean velocity, and the spread of this velocity, which is proportional to the temperature and use those modulus. The main issue with this approach is that as soon as you are not having a distribution of particles which do not follow this mean approach or like, like a second distribution marked in red, this will fail. Uh, the third common approach is the particle and cell code, which we'll discuss today. So in contrast to molecular dynamics, you combine multiple particles together. This is described as a particle shape, if you will. Therefore, you reduce the number of particles you have to model. And instead of simulating the interparticle interaction, you solve the Maxwell equation, and therefore you interact with fields. So the particle-particle interaction becomes is indirect 
via the field that are surrounding these particles. These particles will move, as the name says, freely in a cell, and you solve the electric and magnetic fields themselves. And finally, there exists also Vlasov solver, which solve for the equation directly, but since this is a six-dimensional object, this is very limited and usually only done in very reduced dimensionality. Can I ask? Yes. Uh, so contrasting MD with PIC, yeah. is one advantage for efficiency, for example, that you don't need to keep track of neighbor lists and things like that, because you have never a pairwise interaction to keep track of? Is that in which one? In both, you need neighboring information. So I'm talking about MD yeah. and PIC. So I'm just trying to understand the differences yeah. better. And so you're saying, yeah, I have a neighbor list also in PIC. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in, in PIC, you need to communicate your neighbors because, I mean, with the Maxwell's equation, you've got uh, the curl. So you have derivatives that are formed by neighboring. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, particles will cross a specific cell they start in, and therefore you have to communicate particles as well. So communication is a major issue in PIC codes as well. Is PIC, can, could you say PIC is a coarse grained way of doing MD or not? Is that, I'm trying to better understand what the difference is between the two of them. And I see in that- In some that. sense, yes. So you're okay. sampling your particle attributes by not a field, but by having sample ponds which are freely movable in space. So in some sense, yes. Mm -hmm. But you don't compute forces directly in PIC? If I you compute the forces acting on the particles directly based on the fields the particles surrounded by. Okay. So the motion of your test particles or sampling particles, or usually it's called macro particles, uh, is defined by the surrounding fields. So it's a global property that the force. So I no, no it's, it's a local property. So it's, okay. simply speaking, I will discuss it on the next slide. Okay. Um, you, since this particle is um, spread out in, in space, it has a shape. It is discrete in, in momentum. Otherwise, it would spread out further and become larger and larger over time. So this is not possible, or should not be possible. Um, however, you have a spatial distribution, which you can account for like a weighting, the number of particles it represents, but in the end, it's just like a, just a weighting module. It doesn't have to be physical at that point. It should be, but it doesn't have to be. Um, so you have a distribution like this right here. And based on that, for example, you have a, this charge distribution, you assume of your particle. And it neighbors these particles. And then you do the interpolation based on the uh, grid cells, this particle seeds, and you can increase the number, other than the size of this particle shape. So this is the simplest form, sig, triangular shaped cloud is um, the next step. And this interpolation defines how you compute the force on the one hand, and on, on the other hand, how you compute the current that in the end is needed for the update of the Maxwell's equation. Okay? Okay. And if you're using higher order uh, particle shapes, this becomes uh, numerically more stable. Pick due to the sampling approach you're using, um, with a few particles you're using for sampling, it is intrinsically noisy. Therefore, if you're, for example, simulating, a, in this case, a KHI, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, you have a, two streams. Um, half a stream is the upper part right here. Get my mouse here. Uh, going in one direction, you've got a, another part of the stream going the other direction, and then the, the other half going in the... So you, you shear on two surfaces at that point, and this shearing causes an interact uh, leasing of these two shears, creates magnetic fields, and these magnetic fields act back on the particles, and this, uh, the field on the shear surface uh, grows exponentially. But as you can see with six, so, so in this case, it's a visualization of the fields, it's pretty much only noise. If we go to higher order particle shapes uh, with larger interpolation, TSC, for example, we already see the fields in contrast to the noise. And if we go even further to, to a, a even larger uh, spatial particle shape, you get rid of the noise. So this is the sampling approach and it comes at the cost of some noise. Um, on the other hand, you have to update the fields since we only interact with uh, or 
forces are only applied for the field surrounding the particles. And PIC uses the finite difference time domain methods, FDTT in this method. Uh, common, the most common algorithm possesses the Yi solver. Um, and it defines the Yi grid you see on the left side. And this is a staggered grid for higher numeric accuracy. So you define the electric fields on the edges and the magnetic field in the center. Of course, this exists for all the cells around it. And um, if we now add some labeling, we can define some uh, stencils for that and define the, the curls we have to solve them with the Maxwell's equation. So, for example, on that one, you have a right hand side curl for the magnetic field. It's defined by, um, so if we want to compute this, update this magnetic field, the change in time, it's, it's a di uh, the difference between this minus this and uh, this minus this hardware here. And the same is true for the updates of the electromagnetic fields. And these stencils define how you solve your equations. But I mean, this is the most simple approach to, to do this. And there are more advanced schemes like Galea solver, which gets rid of some numerical inaccuracy of the E solver. Uh, arbitrary order FDTT, that's a new uh, approach Klaus Steiniger will speak about in a couple, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, there are spectral solvers and so on. Um, but this will be, it's a very deep field, and uh, I think Klaus Stanniger will cover this in detail. Richard? Yes. Question? Uh, what about using vector potential and doing gauge transformation? Would that be a feasible option? Could you please repeat? Using vector potential instead of electric field? Um, these are options, but usually it's not done this, um, but I'm currently not aware why not. So some codes like Usually, codes that are based on envelopes only um, use potentials, but most larger PIC codes use fields directly. There might be a reason for that, but I, I mean, right now I'm not sure about it. Probably because you cannot define everything easily by a potential, but because uh, the potential would require you to have a for some kind of solver instead of an updated Maxwell solver, and this is not fast on these systems here. That's why you go directly for the fields and not for the potential. Because, I mean, the, the earlier speakers used uh, Poisson solvers approaches, but uh, that's not fast and not scalable. Okay, just a quick recap. We've got freely moving charging uh, charges that generate electromagnetic fields, and these fields, again, cause forces to act on the charged particles. Of course, we can introduce external electric fields, uh, like a laser, which is an electromagnetic field, but also like uh, magnetic fields from, from coils or whatever. Um, okay. So, the electric fields and the magnetic fields are solved by the Maxwell's equation, and for the particles, we use the Lorentz force acting on these particles. Um, therefore, we have the, the PIC algorithm relies on the following uh, four steps. So, we have our cells, our fields, our particles, and first of all, let's compute the force acting on these particles. Based on that force, we push these particles so they are moving. They can actually cross um, the cell. In this case, this didn't happen. Um, based on that motion of the particles, um, we have to compute the current. And this current now influences the magnetic fields, as you can see right here. In the time evolution of the electric field, the current plays a role. And with that, we now can update our electric and magnetic fields. And based on these updated fields, we again can compute the forces acting on the particles. So one complete cycle com uh, corresponds to one time step in a PIC code. Um, and repeating the cycles allows you to simulate even longer time durations. And the main advantage of this algorithm is that it's all local operations and therefore is ideally suited for parallelization. However, there's some parts missing. And um, so the particle and cell codes only cover the dynamics of the electromagnetic field and the particles moving within them. But for example, ionization, collisions, radiation, and so on can influence the plasma dynamics as well and are essential to model. So you need an additional uh, approach that you add to this classical pick cycle. And these extensions to the pick cycle 
are commonly included. So for example, in PICON GPU, there's the BSI and ADK family and the Thomas family uh, model included for ionization. So BSI is classical ionization model, ADK is uh, tunneling probability based. And what is coming up, and that's what Brian already told you, is that there's a combination with FlyCheck to actually incorporate even uh, not just ground state ionization, but even more intrinsic to the atomic structures. Uh, for collisions, branch tunnels, so um, collision with nuclei is included, and binary collisions model is coming currently. So this is currently an open issue to or open um, pull request and pick on GPU that will be added soon. For radiation, also branch tunnel, of course, synchrotron radiation, so scattering of photons in strong electromagnetic fields. Um, the reduced Landau Lifshitz pusher is included, and we have a classical radiation plugin that predicts radiation that is not covered due to resolution limits by the D grid. Um, with all of that, that's how, in general, our pick cycle works and how we try to uh, solve for the plasma dynamics of various systems. Um, so a main issue to actually perform this simulation in a timely manner is to parallelize these algorithms efficiently. And for that, we'll focus initially on the small scale data structures used and how to parallelize them uh, using alpaca. And then later on, discuss global communication and how to scale those. So again, we have our cells, a bit drawn, a bit differently now. Um, and one way to parallelize our data is to, change, uh, of course, handle the field domain and the particle domain differently. So this is called domain decomposition, and we will handle fields and particles separately. Um, in order to do this efficiently, of course, you, you have a subgroup of cells, and we use a subgroup of cells that's called supercells in our way to manage our data efficiently. And in this case, our supercell is uh, four cells only. In reality, it's 256 cells usually, and you have fields associated with that um, cell, uh, with these cells, and some particles within these cells. And these particles, are stored in frames. On the right-hand side, you see the associated frame um, and where these particles are positioned in these cells. So you have two particles in cell number one, and they are in the list here and there in this frame. There's one particle in cell number two, none in three, and one in four. And if we now add another particle, for example, in cell number three, we need another frame. This is how our data structure is handling, and I'll show you how why this is sufficient in a second. And of course, if we add more like, particle species, not only protons in this case, electrons will add another frame for these particles. Um, so the main reason why we order, or, uh, order our data structures in this way is because with these data structure sizes, we can load these data efficiently into shared memory and therefore only have to load them once while accessing multiple times by multiple workers. Um, and of course you can use registered data, especially speaking on, on GPUs. So let's assume we have an architecture like a GPU, could be also a CPU that has multiple threads acting on these data structures. So for example, if we now operate cell-wise, we load the cell and we handle the particles on the right side. If we now continue, we have a second thread that handles the second cell fields and looks for this particle acting on there. That thread only has to deal with that specific uh, particle for the field, uh, for the cell of the field, and the fourth that of course, has to uh, work on that one and only consider this particle. And the same is true if we now go um, for particle by threading, for example, for particle pushes, which handle each particle, uh, we load the data into shared memory. Um, the first thread sees, its first particle sees it's in cell number one and only has to read cell number one. And this continues for all particles. So this is a simple data. So as you can see, 
you can easily, okay, that's a picture for you. <laughs> you can easily use parallel architecture to scale up the problem. So in this case, we were on a very cell-wise structure. Of course, you can combine these super cells and execute them in parallel as well. And you only have to keep track of data locality at that point to efficiently load the one you, uh, attribute you want to change and load the associated attributes in shared memory. Um, so on the one hand side, you've got this mighty um, powerful warrior Yoda, which is, can do everything, but it is alone. And on the right hand side, you've got an army of clone creator, uh, warriors, uh, which are very stupid, but which can work in parallel and execute, it, um, execute your tasks in parallel efficiently. And this is pretty much the comparison it comes down to. On the one hand, you have a powerful CPU, and on the other hand, you have a powerful GPU. And so far, you would guess, okay, it would be smart to actually parallel as much as possible to, to, because it's easy to speed up as long as you pay attention to sharing your data. Um, therefore, I would vote now for going for GPUs to parallelize this, and that's what the pick on GPU used to do initially. That's why the name also includes the word GPU in it. However, if we now have a look at today's supercomputer at the top 10 of uh, today's supercomputer. This is a very recent list. Number one has no GPUs. It's an ARM processor cluster. Then we've got Summit with GPUs, V100. Uh, at the bottom, Pitstained has also some GPUs. In between their CPU-only systems, it's a mess. It's a hardware zoo um, that changes. So this list is updated every half a year. And while in 2013, the largest cluster was the first one in the top 10 to have GPUs, it was Titan at that point, more and more GPUs became dominant, except for China. Um, their CPU systems are very strong, uh, still are. Um, and now it's ARM. So, so nobody knows where this is going. And uh, an essential point is to not focus on, on a single architecture to run on because that might change quickly. And therefore, Pick on GPU, since a couple of years now, uses Alpaca, which is a, a library to, to abstract the parallelization away, and uh, which tries to, to um, allow to parallelize or to, to write code, parallel code for different architectures. Um, so I'm not the expert on that, so you can go into details for that. I'll just briefly wrap that up. Um, so you have different um, like levels of parallelization you have to deal with, like a grid which covers a whole parallel task. You can want to handle blocks, which is very oriented on, on CUDA language for parallel programming, warps, which are a group of synchronous threads, as called in CUDA, we've got threads as a single element executing some components. The big advantage is that you can map these different uh, parallelization schemes and levels to, to different CPU or GPU. And this interface now supports various backends. I'm not sure whether everything of that is still supported. Oh, yes, I'm a bit surprised about the SQL part, but. Yeah, go on. <laughs> okay. Um, so it supports different backends and the main advantage of this, and this is the important point to stress out here, is that it comes at no overhead cost. So usually you would expect that a library like this comes at some cost that takes away efficiency from your code uh, due to the abstraction. But Alpaca is capable of actually keeping the performance of the native implementation, and this is demonstrated. If you're interested in more, just follow uh, read that paper in the bottom. Um, I'm sorry for, for this huge screen. To not be able to, uh, the, the mouse is dead as well. Um, it takes a while for it to react. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, so this is a big advantage on this small scale parallelization, also like every node. Another way of parallelizing a particle and cell code is, of course, since this weekend are very large simulation, that you split up your 
simulating volume spatially and distributed on the different compute nodes. And do these tasks on different compute nodes, on different GPUs, CPUs, whatever accelerator you want. Um, for that, however, you split up your grid. And by splitting up your grid, you still need to communicate. You need to have, you have particles crossing these borders and you have to do derivatives of these fields. Therefore, you need to commun communicate fields. Therefore, communication is essential on all borders and you have to do this efficiently again. So in order to do this, you will use concurrent kernels and asynchronous communication. So for example, we have a kernel computing the fields. So he's solving our Maxwell's equation. And as soon as it's done with solving the Maxwell's equation, it communicates the fields. And this will take time. While in the meantime, your code should do something, otherwise the hardware is not occupied. And in the meantime, we can do the particle part. We start moving all the species our simulation contains. As soon as this is done, we start communicating again. And if the code realizes, okay, everything is ready for the next step, it continues to compute the fields again. So you've got only a very short period of time where nothing happens. Ideally, there's no such time because communication ends before uh, you reach the next kernel. Um, this cannot always be ensured due to uh, uh, like, like spatial regions with a lot of particles that will require a lot of time to compute this moving part, for example. But in most cases, this can be ensured. And of course, this continues forever until your simulation ends. Okay. So there are two matrices to um, determine to, to yeah, usually um, ways to determine efficiency for um, such codes. That's called this weak efficiency and the strong efficiency. The strong efficiency is you keeps keeps the same problem size and try to speed it up by giving it more resources to solve it faster. This is, however, usually not the approach physicists like to take we are more interested in just using more resources for more computation. And this is called weak scaling, increasing your problem size and sticking with more resources, of course, and staying at the same compute time. And on the left-hand side, so, so this has been done a couple of times on, um, in 2013 on Titan, at that point, the largest cluster in the world, in 2016 at CSCS Pitztaint. I think it was number two at that point, and last year on Summit. Largest system. Was this taken with um, data output? No, no, this is taken without data output. Okay. Data output is another issue I'll discuss in the next part. Um, and as you can see, our weak efficiency is beyond 95%. So if we increase our problem size, it stays pretty much like a constant compute size if we give it more resources. And this is a good news if you want to do really large scale simulations. Um, so now to the I.O. issue. <laughs> so I.O. is a big issue since we're not computing something that is easily analyzed, that this complex dynamics in space with fields being relevant for the particle dynamics, you usually cannot reduce the output of the simulation to a single number or something like that. Usually you want to have a look into the dynamics and you have to store some output, and more output is usually better than the reduced output. So on the one hand side, you've got pick on GPU, and on the right hand side, you've got your common file system. Uh, so pick on GPU produces data like this excavator, while your file system is this little baby trying to handle the sand produced. To Put this a bit more quantitative. Um, let's take a 2013 example. We take an old GPU, K20X. Uh, it has six gigabytes of data in the RAM, which we can use for, for our computation. So this is the available data. And with a pick cycle, we can run 10, 10 steps in a second. Uh, the PCI Express has only six gigabytes per second. It's quite fast, but we have a bandwidth reduction of one-tenth already. If we now want to put this onto our IO or our file system, 
we end up with a factor 100, 200th less because, for example, the Titan system has only 42 megabytes per second to the file if you run efficiently in parallel. If you do this on a single node, there's no way you can read that number. And the more modern system, Pitstein, for example, is even less uh, efficient. And if you go to Summit, this is even worse. So while you have more and more resources to compute, your I.O. bandwidth doesn't scale with it. And this problem becomes larger and larger for you. On the right hand side, you see uh, the efficient I.O. throughput. Uh, you can reach with different uh, libraries. So for example, Adios and uh, Parallel HDF5. And for example, for Parallel HDF5, you would need 25 minutes break in your simulation to write a, a petabyte of data in parallel and therefore also your library's efficiency depends on, on how fast you can write data. So one option would be, okay, perhaps we can reduce the data on the fly. I mean, if we are using accelerators, commonly GPUs, um, we have free resources on the CPU side. Why not use them for data reduction? I have a question about that. So if you output anything, do you output this in a single file synchronously or like do you have to sync over the whole simulation or does every node just run its own file down? Both. Both. Um, so with HDF5 parallel, you have a single file um, which is handled in parallel. So you usually allocate slots on the file system where you write them. With ideas, these are multiple files, um, but not like every node writes one file because if you're, for example, taking 18,000 ranks on an MPI call, and you write one file or one output, it opens 18,000 uh, project uh, file handlers and your system goes down. So no, it's, it's a reduced number of files. Okay, um, okay what you see is um, compression algorithms. So FC is your compression rate. So FC1 equals no compression. FC0.1 is 10%, uh, like reducing to 10%. Um, and your performance ratio means, okay, um, at one, I'm pretty much needing this time as, uh, as long as I would have without compression. And as you can see, you need lots of resources uh, to actually do this compression. And it's not possible on all architectures because for example here, this, it's not that efficient. So compression on the fly will not solve all your problems. If we reduce the data slightly, um, so therefore, you do not fill the file system as fast as before, but it will not totally solve your I.O. issue by just reducing that number to nothing. Um, so compression doesn't help per se. Again, just an example. Um, let's take uh, the, our KHI Kelvin Hammers instability simulation of 2013. So we produced a lot of performance was like 7.2 petaflops double precision, 1.5 petaflops single precision on 18,000 nodes. That ends up to be 90 petabytes per time step you have to handle. Therefore, for the entire 4,000 time steps, that's 180 exabytes of data. That's something you don't want to store. And the only way to do an efficient analysis of this data, if you need to handle all the data, is in situ data analysis, which means Part of your code will be used, or part of your simulation time will be used to do the data analysis inside the simulation itself. And then pick on GPU, we support various um, so-called plugins, which are add-ons to do the data analysis on the fly using the GPU architecture directly, having direct access to the memory of the GPU, therefore needing no communication. Um, and I just plotted a few of them. Uh, so you have an energy histogram, which determines the total energy distribution of all particles um, over time. You've got a radiation plugin, which computes radiation based on the particle trajectories. Um, particle trajectories as post-processing would end up in those exabyte scales, even for smaller simulations. Um, and for example, you can also do something fancy to explore your simulation interactively with a, a so-called ISAAC live visualization. So this is, even if this looks like a video, commonly you just start a server infrastructure to have a live look into your simulation to see what is happening. And on top of that, you see the 
Uh, so this part right here is, is coupled with the radiation plugin. You see the uh, uh, instantaneous emitted radiation at that point. So you have feeling how to understand your simulation while it's running, adjust accordingly the parameters, and this allows a very interactive uh, way of doing simulations. Um, and finally, and an important point is the next step is going to be in C2 data analysis on steroids using RDOS 2 So instead of the few data outputs you still need to dump on files, as it currently done, so you have uh, your application data, at some point you still need an output to the um, persistent storage. It can be the text files or HDF5 files because you cannot analyze everything on the fly. You need some interactivity on that. And you will have the streaming capability. So instead of directly writing us, it's going to the OpenPMD API. Um, and you have the option to directly stream to an open API, open PMD API receiver, um, which does the analysis on the fly. It never, never has to touch a file system. Uh, I'm pretty certain that there's going to be a talk on that as well. Um, okay. So a quick note on how we develop code. I mean, we develop it open source, uh, therefore we use GitHub for both the source and the development. So every discussion on the code is happening there. Uh, we use read the docs for open documentation and for every publication, we try to have as much open data as possible using either Zenodo or Odara, the HDR clone of Zenodo. Um, so for development, you simply open up a branch, the code you propose is discussed and these discussions are public as well. And finally, if everything goes well, it goes back to the main line and is merged. And what you see on the right-hand side is the evolution of the PIC code over time. Um, and the little dots moving around are the different developers adding code to it, touching files. At some points, you see a restructuring of the code where the tree suddenly looks different, but this is a very interactive process. And it should be, it, it's, it has been shown that the, the open approach is, is quite beneficial. Um, another essential part for this kind of development is that you do regular testing. Um, so this is one of the earlier views on, on how we test it, and it's still in the code. Um, we run a variety of cases that have to compile. So if you add code to it and it doesn't compile, it will give you some down in this, in this case, and you won't be able to merge that code. However, doing so allows you to have uh, to ensure stability of the code while still continuously developing it. If you're lucky and you did everything right, you get a thumbs up by the system and today it looks a bit more dif different. So under Axel Hübel's picture right here is this thumbs up, thumb down uh, thing. You have a continuous integration check by checking code styles and currently it's a GitLab test CI we also imply. And only if everything passes and if some of the maintainers give their okay to what you did in the code, um, the update is accepted. So that's all for the case, uh, for, the, for the code base. Um, so let's have a quick look at uh, for some physics scenarios simulated with PIC on GPU, starting from the nanometer scale LWFA, Michael mentioned initially as well, and going to interstellar jets. So what you see right here is an ISOAC live visualization of uh, a laser interacting with a plasma. So the plasma particles are this colorful part and you see the, the laser is not really drawn, it's, it's the center part and it pushes aside the electrons and it creates this wake, this hollow re region around it. And in this electron free region behind the laser, strong fields are created that can be used for accelerating electrons. Um, what is the dimension of this, uh, the scales? Right? Um, so the laser pulse is around 30 femtoseconds in duration. And the entire one cavity is, I think, 20 micrometers in scale. The transversal size at this case is, I think, 12, 15 micrometers. And it's moving close to the speed of light. So you gain the acceleration of uh, quite quickly in a, in a millimeter or two. Um, while it's moving through the plasma. Um, 
And one of the interesting things we, we try to study together with the experimentalists is to understand their experimental setup. So experimental setups usually are not as perfect as we like to have them. So for example, a laser is not as simple as a Gaussian envelope as we like to assume it, but it has higher modes due to how it's created in experiments, due to the mirrors used, due to the uh, gain medium and so on. And the experimentalists measured what, how their laser looked like in detail. This is not an easy measurement, but we've seen that we had a slight change from the Gaussian distribution with some higher modes being like circular rings around the laser. And we always got lower energies with what we simulated. And by including uh, these higher modes, these are only minor differences in the transversal profile of the laser, we got the right final energy. So what you see right here is, this is the position of the laser while propagating through the plasma. And this is our electron and, uh, distribution studied with this in situ data analysis of the energy histogram. And you see this energy, where's my mouse? My mouse is coming, there it is. Uh, you see the energy gain over time. And with these slightly different laser modes, you have an earlier injection. At this point, it's an ionization injection scheme, so this is very straightforward. Um, and therefore, you, since you started earlier, you end up with higher energies in the end. And this pre explains the experimental results much better than what is commonly simulated. And this has been published um, down here in Nature Communications and uh, Plasma Physics and Control Fusion. Um, and this has been simulated, for example, in the Towers cluster at, uh, H at TL Dresden. The next step is using this experimental setup I just discussed, and using it as a second, um, second stage, but getting rid of the laser. So what you see is still this LWFA stage. So in green now, you see the background electrons. In blue, you see our injected bunch, which sees a strong electric field. In red, you see the laser and it's accelerated. Now we're entering a down ramp, so we inject a second bunch. So the, the, the cavity grows larger. You see in pink a second uh, bunch, and then we extract the laser, we back reflect it by solid foil. So the laser cannot penetrate that solid foil, but our electrons, they are relative, so it just goes through that foil. And now we replace the laser by the first electron bunch and start accelerating the purple or pinkish bunch in the same cavity. This is called PWFA, plasma wake speed acceleration. And it has some benefits because there's, for example, no dephasing. Our laser in LWFA doesn't propagate at the speed of light. It propagates through a medium and thus is slower than the electron that accelerates. And therefore, at some point, the electrons will move relative to the laser, closer to the laser, and will not be accelerated anymore. This doesn't happen that early with this approach. And for that, we did, again, a campaign for experiments and simulations. And it has been shown that they have a great, so now you see a bit more complicated energy histograms. Um, this is what they measured. So they have a screen where they have on the one hand a bending magnet putting the electrons onto one axis of the screen for the energy. So this is both energy. Um, and the other one is the, the, the spatial direction, the pointing of these electrons. And we see great agreement between simulations and experiments and could explain various aspects of the simulation of that. However, these simulations require both high performance and advanced modeling, since on the one hand side, we still need to incorporate these higher laser modes for the first stage, and we need more advanced field solver algorithms to get rid of artifacts that are usually not important for LWFA, but become essential for PWFA, where you also need to reproduce the electron bunch properties quite well. And with that, we could strengthen various hypotheses of the plasma dynamics happening in these kinds of accelerated until the part that we were able to reach predictive capabilities for real experiments. Um, it's, currently, it still looks even better than that. And then, that's not what I usually do. Um, there is a group led by Thomas Kluge um, that try, uh, simulates ion acceleration from solid foil targets called traveling uh, target normal sheet acceleration. And it studies 
Um, so, so this is how this works. I'll stop the video, it's quite fast <laughs> to explain it on the fly. So you have a laser interacting with a solid foil. As mentioned before, the, the laser is not directly capable of penetrating the foil, will be back reflected, but it heats up the electron in the foil. These electrons will be pushed out. The, the blue part you see it are now green. They are moving out. At some point you destroy the foil, the laser propagates through. That doesn't necessarily have to happen. And this cloud of electrons leaving that foil will create electric fields be between the foil and these field, uh, elect electrons. And these strong fields remain there for a while so that you can accelerate protons or charged ions in, in these fields and therefore uh, accelerate protons. And a PhD student of Thomas, um, Marco Garten, studied the influence of preplasmas generated by uh, like this plateau regions right there. So on, the, on this tiny uh, plot right here, you see different laser profiles in time. So in blue, it's the perfect laser, only Gaussian in temporal contrast. But then you've got a, a like up ramp region right here and even stronger up ramp regions. And what he found out is that neither the perfect laser nor the one with the strong ramp produce the highest proton energies. Ideally, you use one of these in-between uh, profiles because at that point, the overlap of the generated fields and the protons is strongest and your protons see the strongest fields remain there longer and therefore are capable of reaching the highest energies, in this case around 150 MeV. So he determined a way to, to optimize the thickness and the leading edge of the laser. The main issue for this simulation campaign uh, performed at Pitt Saint at CSCS in Switzerland is that he produced around four petabytes of raw output. And that's already reduced output. He reduced it further on the fly, but the uh, CSCS has strict policies on how long you can keep your data. So he transferred that entire data set, slightly reduced, to Taurus due to a higher bandwidth to Taurus and transferred then a further reduced set to HFDR. And on all these steps, he did data analysis to slightly reduce the data set and finally could, could store the data for, for longer since it has to be published. Um, but at that point, we were capable of producing these large amounts of data, but ran into other issues with storing that data, keeping that for a while and transferring it from cluster to cluster. And this is another issue not even mentioned in this initial I have a, discussion. Yes. I have a physics question real quick. So at, when you uh, show the target normal sheet acceleration, yep. um, your laser gets reflected by the foil, but the foil is already disintegrating somehow. Yep. How do you describe this uh, reflection of the laser? I, th I would have thought that you probably go on it like, okay, I have a different refraction index in the foil and in the vacuum, probably, or? So in, in real pixel so this is just a toy simulation um, to visualize the effect. So in reality, you, you burn through that foil, but not that quickly. So usually most of the lasers reflect it. Um, but in reality, you model your target accordingly. So you assume you have non uh, you have atomic structures, like you have your, uh, plastic coating, so you have carbon, you've got hydrogen, you've got your steel, you might have some oxygen due to oxidation. So, so preparing these targets in detail, how they are in reality, either plastic or like metal foils, is very important for these targets. And that's also part of the study that Marco Garten performed with these. So, so I, I'm not sure whether this is in there, that he used different targets. Uh, it's not in these slides, but he do, you also use different target materials um, as well. And this is an important thing. It, and it even goes further. I mean, by, to, to optimize this process, um, people not only think about flat foils, but like pizza cone uh, uh, targets are developed. They are foam targets that have uh, like this foam structure with like vacuum in between so that you have a different absorbing capability, create lots of electrons on the front side by destroying the foam and then hitting a solid region. So um, they even 
parts is currently together with the uh, Weizmann Institute that at HDR they try to um, have gas in front of the foil to have a further focus down region. So, so this foil laser interaction optimization and even the laser optimization itself is a big issue on this kinds of research. Okay. Okay, and this is just a quick, let's go back, quick outlook. So there has been another study by Axel Huber, um, ion acceleration from droplets. I won't go into detail on that. So what they had experiment, there was an experiment in Munich. They had a plastic um, droplet, very small, a couple of micrometers in scale that they put into a, um, a trap. So it's slightly charged, they kept it, kept it levitating and tried to hit it with a laser. And not all of the laser shots hit it, uh, like the one of those droplets perfectly, but there were side shots. Like, uh, but this simulation, um, so they had a pre-study in 2D, which couldn't reproduce the experiments at all. And then there was time left for a single 3D simulation that's plotted right there on the right-hand side. Um, and it reproduced the experiment perfectly. It got the right energy with the energy region the protons reached and it could reproduce a quasi monoenergetic proton uh, acceleration process uh, which was caused by um, how the laser interacts with that droplet it, the, 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 some prepulses expand that droplet already make it under dense so the laser can go through that droplet of plasma uh, refocus and therefore you your electrons are very narrow. So if this, this electron sheath goes only in the forward direction, therefore the protons go with it and are only accelerated in forward direction, which is not common for TNSA. Uh, and that was big advantage. So can I ask you? Yeah. So how will the droplet be modeled in that case? The droplet is simply like a sphere and you assume some prepulses arriving at a specific timing to the main laser pulse. So inside the pick, it will be like particles or? inside the PICO, so um, the time, the time scale of prepulses in high power laser systems is much larger than PICOs are capable of simulating. So usually, and the intensity is low, so usually you would do this with... Uh, but you still have laser propagating, right? So time, yeah. time scale will be the same, I, I thought. Yeah, but your numerics become crappy. Um, so usually you do some either fluid simulations before, or you do some very basic estimates on, on how prepulses will expand your plasma. Okay. So in force, you assume a preplasma due to um, due to what happens to the um, well, with the prepulse and how it expands. And in this case, it's just not like the perfectly spherical droplet anymore, but it has expanded to the internal heating. And this is in this case an analytical assumption. Okay. And based on that, then the main laser pulse is simulated with um, Higgin GPU. Um, okay, and this run on Titan again. And then another simulation that ran on Titan is the uh, Kelvin Helmholtz instability, which is expected to occur in interstellar jets. So, an interstellar jet has relativistic velocities that will shear on the surrounding plasma. And you see these surfaces, this are how the magnetic fields are generated. And these magnetic fields again cause electrons to accelerate. And that is what drawn in this. 3D visualization of the change in momentum. And this change in momentum results in radiation being emitted. So what you see right here, initially with the onset of that instability, you have this dome of radiation. So the direction is the direction it is emitted in this relative velocity frame. And the color is the intensity of the radiation and the depth of that half dome is the frequency. And if we continue further, with this um, simulation, we see that with increase, with a stronger, um, with the increase of the instability, you have stronger fields. Uh, stronger acceleration, of course, is causes stronger radiation. The dome becomes more bright, and this continues until you see some substructures that are of interest. And what we found out uh, is that on the one hand side, this instability has a characteristic change in polarization. Um, so you see the different polarization options you have right here over time and with the onset of the Kelvin-Helmets instability this dramatically changes. And this can be used 
to identify this instability by observing it on Earth. Um, and on the other hand, the growth of the radiation is proportional to the growth of the instability. And by measuring how fast the intensity of it grows, you can determine how fast that instability grows in an interstellar jet. Therefore, determining other quantities of that state, learning more about interstellar jets. Um, and finally, just an outlook of what was currently done. Um, Alexander Debus has proposed a method to overcome today's limitations of laser plasma acceleration, which is currently limited by the speed of how fast a uh, laser propagates in a plasma and how fast it loses its energy. And he therefore proposed a two laser pulse system, which has an overlap right in the center right here. And this overlap creates the driver. So the combined intensity of both lasers actually creates your driver for the cavity. And by using the right geometry of this, you can continuously feed in energy and you can overcome the reduction in propagation speed. The driver in this case can actually propagate with the speed of light in vacuum. Therefore, you overcome depletion and dephasing, therefore allowing to reach really high energies. And this is currently being tested at Summit as a preparation for the upcoming Frontier cluster. Um, yes, so this will be one of the next simulations we perform on large scale systems. So this is an overview of what we've done with Pick on GPU, just as a brief summary, you're back. <laughs> uh, I introduced you to the fundamental concepts of particle and cell codes. I showed you some schemes for parallelization on the example how we do the Pick on GPU. Um, I discussed the need for abstraction for parallelization, in this case using alpaca, the need for in situ data analysis. Uh, we discussed very briefly how we do our open source development. And I showed you various simulation covering a variety of physics scenarios. So thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? No questions in which. Yeah, no questions. <laughs> well, I have a question. So <laughs> if you compare anything to experiments, probably a lot of influence you have is how you model your target or like a TNSA or something like that. Yes. Do we have any way of like benchmarking your target models against experiments at the moment or? I'm cur uh, currently, I think um, it's like more for, for TNSA, what is done right now at HDR is more like a qualitative agreement, not a quantitative agreement mm -hmm. because there's, it's more difficult for TNSA than for LWFA, for example, where we have yeah, or whatever experimental setup you will. Yeah, I mean, for, 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 for like LWFA setups, we try to reach quantitative predictions okay. by actually going into the details of how your target looks like by going. Uh, it's not only like, like uh, usually you do this um, density profile reconstruction for LWFA based on. on the, Propagating through a laser, but this average out um, your density. And now we have a different method by, by having actually electron wake propagating and having shatography pictures from that. Therefore, your resolution for the density fluctuations goes to the 10 micrometer scale. It's much better. It doesn't average out, but it's a really difficult method. But it allows you to actually reproduce spikes introduced by shocks, for example. Um, at, in with some limitations, but yes, we're trying to, to model with PICON GPU since it has a capability of being fast and accurate and pretty um, to, to model as close as possible to the experiment if we want to have comparison to that experiment. Of course, I mean, we can still do uh, simple simulation for that as well. So, so one may, may be adding on that. Uh, I, I'm not sure, did you show some of the IBEP stuff? Um, no, no, but yes, but this could be shown. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, as as you might know, there is a there is a large setup called Helmholtz International Beamline for Extreme Fields, which is basically putting a high energy laser and a high power laser 
next to the European XFEL. And there they want to shoot solid density targets with, for example, a high power laser. So something similar to what we have here at, at HCBR. And there you can do such laser ion acceleration experiment or any laser interaction with solid density targets. So usually we take the high energy lasers, which have much longer pulses, but one of the interesting things is to also look really at the ultra short laser pulse interaction with the targets at really high intensities. And there you can, using the European XFEL basically as a, as a probing tool, what you could do in principle is look at the dynamics in the, inside the target of electron transport on the scales at which we are doing the simulations. So this loop sounds all awesome, but in reality, it means that actually you're adding a lot of complexity there because the, the, uh, all of this is a highly nonlinear development. And with the XFEL, you're getting much more information, but not usually for the first shot more insight. You just get more information and you have to interpret in, in the same way that you interpret your simulations. But of course, now you basically have an experimental technique that allows you to have high resolution, both in time and space, information from experiment that is comparable to what the simulation can deliver. But especially the solid density targets, they are very hard in terms of characterizing the targets and also the uh, laser itself because also the sp spatial and temporal variation in the laser intensity does a lot to drive any nonlinear process so, so usually between shots a variation of 10 to 15 percent is high quality that can mean a lot and you don't know actually if your laser spot is very nice because you're not probing it anywhere except for maybe one small point or something. So there's a lot to be done in order to understand what's really happening. And on top of that, even if you would be able to characterize your foil perfectly, you have some repulses that actually cause expansion of them. And then the main laser will interact with some other targets, which you create. So it's, 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 yeah. as Michael mentioned, it's, it's extremely complex process. It's not only understanding targets, it also requires understanding your laser. I just came up with this question because you said you wanted to, for instance, uh, optimize some acceleration yields or something like that of mm -hmm. certain part of the species. And I thought that you can, oh, and you can maybe uh, predict some optimal range for the acceleration yield in your simulation, but it doesn't have to like reflect the real world if your target has like some weird inconsistency or like inhomogeneity of somewhere. Course, I mean, in the end, the predictions you make with simulations can find an optimum that you are not capable of reaching in experiment, but usually you try to <coughs> experimentally realize. To, to, to give you another idea, free pulse is, free pulse means that not all the energy of a laser is actually in the main pulse. But such a laser usually looks like that it has a very, very high power and then a plateau with lower power. It usually hasn't been a problem for a long time. But since lasers have really become very powerful, even this plateau, because everything shifts up by three, four orders of magnitude, the plateau comes up as well. And this is now so intense that it usually now reaches intensities at which the interaction of the laser with the foil creates, um, creates relativistic electrons. And on a time scale, that is much longer than the pulse itself. So the pulse is usually a few 10 femtoseconds, and this plateau can reach a, a thousand times longer to 10 picoseconds or something. 
And then there comes another plateau on the nanosecond scale, which considerably heats the target and can also alter the target both from the temperature and the mechanical properties. So in order to really do the full process, you would actually have to go from nanoseconds to the attosecond scale, so nine orders of magnitude. And because you need to do this in time, and because this is an explicit code, and because this also changes the overall interaction, you have to do also considerable scale up in terms of volume that you are actually really simulating. Because once the target is expanding, it usually expands at close to at least the sound speed, which is considerable. So it really will take, once the laser pulse actually comes in, you already have a huge simulation box with attosecond resolution, with nanometer resolution, but really going to the nanosecond scale, so nine times higher. And really looking at several 10 micron or maybe 100 micron in size. So these are really, really, really huge simulations, both in memory and, and in time to do this right. And the best we can do in terms of stability of the code right now is in, I would say, in the few picosecond, maybe 10 picosecond regime. Yes. That's the max we can do right now. After that, the numerical method, because it's an ex explicit method, becomes so noisy and problematic that your results become wrong due to the numerics. And I would say that's pretty much state of the art. I know just a few codes who can really go at full scale to that kind of length. So that's, you have, you have to see that's a 10, 10 million time steps or maybe even more. By the way, every explicit particle method out there that can do more than 10 million time steps would be a major improvement, regardless of the specific application area or whatever. I think I've never heard of any explicit past particle method that can do much more than 10 million time steps and still be correct. So it's a magical number right now, in many senses. And the implicit methods or implicit servers are just too slow. Yeah, there are several reasons. First of all, the implicit methods, they are hard to parallelize often. But that's not the only reason. The other reason is much of the dynamics here is still linked to that small time step. So implicit methods, I could use a large time step, but that basically means bumping over all the tiny, tiny, uh, dynamics that are actually important. For example, anything that is an instability starts with a tiny seed and then grows exponentially. So if I bump over that, how? You know, the implicit method doesn't know that in between the, the conditions was fulfilled that there is actually some form of instability. So it will just boom, boom, go over it and nothing will happen. So I really have to be at that scale. So, so there's no much need in, in making the time step larger. It really means being more stable with the same amount of time steps. Or even going 10 times higher, 100 times higher. That's by the way why we try to make the code as fast as possible. There are two reasons for that. The first one is more time steps in a given window and really creating speed up. And the other one is doing more simulations in some amount of time because that gives you parameter scans, something that, as you probably have pointed out, is really urgent. Uh, can I ask something? So when you have simulations like 2,400 GPUs, like uh, it's like you decompose the simulation domain into like each GPU, 
Yeah. But then you still need to communicate between the GPUs, right? Yeah. So, so you have a special volume that is covered by one GPU. You have at that point for this simulation, we've got uh, you have communications with the CPU, which handles the communication between all the MPR ranks. Yeah. Uh, in this case, we're using a penny band. Um, and then you communicate your borders. So you, you have to go from device to host and then communicate through MPA and yes. then host to device. There are options to, to do GPU communications directly, but for this system in this case. But still, that's faster. Like, uh, it's faster than. Uh, like you said, you, you still get 95% efficiency for larger number of nodes. Uh, so, uh, is for it, that point, yes. I, I mean, I, I've shown so in an earlier benchmark you showed that you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this, this benchmark right here. It used to be there as well. I'm sorry for skipping through all these. Um, yeah, so this, so this, this is the this system, and it is above, even above. above uh, this is this mouse, sorry. <laughs> um, it's even beyond 95%. And here we are at 4,000, uh, 2,000, sorry, 6,000. It's very tiny for this one, sorry. But yes, it has the same weak scaling. So yes, with the overall communication needed, due to the asynchronous communication, we still reach a high uh, efficiency. So, so the, the there's there's a secret behind that, and the secret is combining the task, the data parallelism that you have within particles and fields, with task parallelism. So that basically so that, uh, yeah. you have yeah. Yeah. exactly you have an asynchronous copy of data during. Okay, uh, so it's. Uh, yeah, it's it's working on something while the communication is happening behind it. Yeah. So but I see that there are two stages of communication, one for the fields and one for the very simplified at that point. That's a very simplified picture. But okay. even more complicated. Yeah. So I mean in the end you also have the different ranks that all do this in parallel. They have different points where they finish their computing the fields. They know which to which nodes they have to communicate and so on. So this is Becoming a real complex problem. This is very simplified. For, okay. Uh, in this but for each cycle, you can say each peak cycle, you can say that there is there are at least two checkpoints, like communication synchronization. There are many. There are many more. There are many more. There are many more. But yes, in, in principle, you can say you have to at least communicate your fields, and you have at least to communicate your particles. Yeah. It is simple. But in reality, this is one one of one of the interesting developments that came out of this, and that's a library that that Jan will also be working on or taking up a bit, is Michael Zippel's Red Grapes library. So Red Grapes is a is a library where you define data dependencies. So you say, for example, the next task needs that data from the previous task. And what Red Grapes does is developing from these data. So this exists in many of these uh, data-centric packages like Spark or something, where you basically define data dependencies between different algorithms and say that you can create a data-centric workflow. And this library basically takes there you formulate the data dependencies, like when I know, when I need to move the protons, I first need to know their own positions, or I need the pores acting on the protons to be there. I can formulate this in the code as dependencies, and what the library then does is develop a task graph, including the communications, and then deploying this task graph according to the to the tasks needed. This for writing this strongly reduces the amount of code that you need to write. Because previously you had to spawn all of these different tasks, copying from shared memory to main memory to in the GPU, then going to device memory, then doing the MPI just to get out of the GPU and back to the next node. 
But actually, that's not needed when you know that there is a path and you just need the data because you can regenerate the path from your knowledge where you are and what to do there. So it's a great reduction of complexity inside the code to talk about data dependencies rather than talking about actual communication of data. Uh, can, I, can I interrupt you shortly? Yeah. Uh, one, one correction to red grapes, you don't define data dependencies in red grapes, you only define, um, uh, you define it somehow implicitly, you just define what data your task needs and red grapes is then uh, looking up for data dependencies of other tasks. Oh, even better, yes. Yeah, so, so you have, as programmer only define that you have now a task, you need, uh, you define which data you need and then you enqueue this task and uh, RedClips is, is building the dependency graph for that and then is scheduling uh, as soon as possible, depending on scheduling strategies, uh, when you can perform a task, when, when, when are all uh, dependencies are solved and your task can be uh, uh, started. You only say what you want, not where you get it from. Yes. That's wonderful. Do you also optimize the task graph then? So, I mean, you can define inefficient operations and it will run inefficiently, but if you know the dependencies, you can also optimize like a compiler. In theory. Yeah, um, uh, Red Trips is designed that you have a dependency graph and, you, and a scheduling graph, and both can be uh, uh, handled independently. independently. So um, there is an, an, an first implementation for both, and uh, for example, for scheduling only the FIFO scheduling, uh, but uh, it is open to, to extend other scheduling strategies or also do uh, on, on the graph itself. Yes, you don't want to write that much code. Because uh, compilers are really efficient in optimizing such stuff. Also. So if you put in LLV, like LLVM optimization algorithms on there, they could handle this, I guess. Well, in principle, yes. Any other questions? Yeah, one more. So in, in PIC, there is in general no particle-particle uh, -particle interactions directly. In the basic algorithm, not yes. Okay, so that's I think one difference in, between MD okay. related to what you asked in the beginning. Yeah, that's what, yeah, what I understand. But it doesn't need to construct for each particle, it, it doesn't need the neighbor list. Like in, it doesn't need to get the neighbor list similar to molecular. Yeah, the basic algorithm is not, but there is coming, and as mentioned, the binary collision operation, and mm -hmm. there you just randomly shuffle neighboring particles together. Okay. To, have some collision effects. There's, there's even more coming up, so that's in the further future. Basically, if you have a structure like a supercell, from that you can construct, you don't need to construct a neighbor list as such, but you need to construct something like which particles belong to which cell, which we do not have as general information right now, because for the general pick simulation, it's, you don't have a set like all these particles hmm. belong to cell one. Cell list you know that each particle below, belongs to one cell, but you still have to construct this kind of data to say, these are all the particles belonging to cell 15. Okay. You know, this, this, this is something you still need to construct. And you, this information is there, but you have to gather that information, because it's not, it's, explicit in, in a data structure. What I would be very interested in to actually inside at least a supercell, which is one of these uh, highly vectorized units of, of computation to have both binary operators, so really n cross m, and even n cubed interactions. Why? First of all, binary, what, what, what Richard just said was basically binary as a random process, you know? You know that you have binary collisions anyway, you know what the binary collision integral looks like, and you basically just sample that integral by Monte Carlo. The pairwise interaction. 
That's the pairwise interaction, but in the Monte Carlo way, so that you're basically linear. Okay, because you're not going through all the pairs. You're just selecting a random one that is representative for several random ones that are representative for the collisions, which is a good thing. But what would be very interesting what to, would be to actually have full n squared or even n cubed. n cubed is very important for, uh, by the way, both for active media, but also strongly correlated and especially for effects like re recombination. So recombination is where you have an ionized plasma and an ion gets an electron back. Funnily, if you have one electron and one ion, this does not happen very often, even if the ion is highly charged. And the reason for this is that you have to fulfill both energy conservation and, uh, and uh, momentum conservation at the same time. Actually, what happens much more is that there is a third particle involved, either an electron or usually another electron at least, or some kind of photon or whatever. Something that takes up additional energy and momentum that otherwise would have no way to go. So actually processes for recombination taking into account three particles instead of two are much more common and dominate recombination. And so modeling recombination ab initio would require three particles. So that's n cubed. And now the interesting part is if you can really put this in a supercell. A supercell is a rather large structure. Because you have so many particles in there and it's an n squared or an n cubed thing and you can efficiently, or you could efficiently use a cache there to run over this. That would be a very interesting thing computationally wise, because if you could pull this off, it would basically mean that you have, a, that you probably have a high cache reuse, or at least some, in, a, in the fastest part of the memory, a lot of in operations with a single set of data before you go to the next, because it's at least n squared or n cubed. And in one cell, you can have sometimes 10 or even 100 particles. And a supercell is 128 or 256 cells. You know? So that's a huge number of particles already. It would certainly bring, bring execution time through the roof. But at the same time, it would give a better ratio between memory op operations on fast memory bits and communication, you know, because you would now really spend a lot of time to do this. And you could, in my opinion, really model a lot of atomic and, and collisional effects in those plasmas almost from an up initial point of view. So that's very interesting to do. But if you do particle-particle interaction, I think after each particle update, you have to uh, communicate with other neighbors, right? Because in, in this case, since uh, in, in this case, you can update the particle position and after the time step, you can tell that it went out of the set. It went to the next, moved to the next GPU. But in that case, if one particle changes, then that information should be updated to the neighboring GPUs. No, no, not directly. No, you can go, go over the whole thing and then do it. Because you're, that, first, that we because you're not pushing right away. You're just creating the DP over DT first. All you have to get is the DP over DT because there are two, two contributions. First of all, the change in momentum in that time step due to the electromagnetic forces that are on the grid. And of course, at the same time, the inner forces between the particles. And you would need to sum them up. And then there are wonderful, nice tricks due to the nature of physics and the nature of nature that you can actually form very nice subsets of these particles.
because you can ignore any collision where the relative velocities, any, any collisional effect, any inter interaction. You can basically ignore if the relative velocity of particles is really high. With high, I mean O point, beta O point one or higher. You can basically say, forget about it. It won't happen, it doesn't matter. So what you do is basically not just see which part particles are close to each other and should actually interact in space, but also in velocity space, so in phase space. So you really can do a phase space clustering and say these particles will actually interact and these particles will interact because they have slow relative motion and they have uh, they are close to each other so you can form clusters that interact and then the trick is and this is where the sampling method that Richard mentioned actually breaks down is the sampling method Richard is talking about means that you take some form of distribution for a collisional process and say I can, it has, it is basically a Gaussian distribution, more or less a temperature distribution, and I take one particle that samples this distribution. But in all the cases Richard was showing, there are at least two or three or four of these distributions. There's highly energetic particles close to the speed of light going through a cell while there is a background that is close to, 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 to a few hundred Kelvin or something, so nothing there. Describing this by something like this won't work. So the really neat thing is you don't have to, once you can cluster in phase space and say these just belong to each other, and then the only thing you really have to do is see whether inside one peak time step, their interaction matters because you can give them a common velocity, a common Lorentz boost, a common time, and then say, will anything inside a particular time step that you now consider actually make sense or not? And by this, you have a very nice and robust algorithm to actually decide which, collect which collective interactions matter, which don't. And this, of course, you can all do inside a large enough area, the supercell, while still probably being able to stay in the fastest part of the memory of your machine. Because if you go outside this, you're doomed. You simply can't do this. Everything would break, break down in terms of performance. So I would love to see that. I would really love to see n squared and especially n cubed operations in big. Because it, it was it would allow so much up initio atomic physics to happen that would be wonderful. Still, it's not enough, by the way. There's a lot of problems. Any further questions? I would like to ask a, a question. Um, at some point, you showed the amount of data output that those simulations create, and you numbered those at like petabytes or even exabytes. And I wondered, why do we even need to store all this data? Nobody has time to look at that. Those are such a vast amount of data. I agree like, with you. Um, ideally, you know what you want to ask beforehand, and then explicitly do the data analysis for that on the fly, and therefore mm -hmm. produce one number next in extreme case afterwards you mentioned those plugins where you had like like histograms for example so you know okay like i'm, I'm going to do a run and i look at like a few distributions and now like render a, a 4k video from this angle yeah and that should boil down to like a few gigabytes of output that's like yes, it does yes it does but you're right if i know what is happening at least in some degree um I know what to analyze, and then I can dramatically reduce the amount of data I have to put out. And we already did that. Um, I didn't mention that. So there's a, 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 a method called a Praxia uh, framework, which does automated pick on GPU simulation submissions for large parameter scans. And 
So these are hundreds of simulations running in parallel. And there we ask an explicit question that can be boiled down to a simple set of numbers, which then does, due to the large scale of parameters we covered, uh, explicitly answers how does these specific parameters like mean energy, energy spread of an electron bunch changes with changing the laser parameters, the density parameters. That is definitely possible. But in a lot of cases, you initially need to have an explorative approach because you are not entirely sure what is essential. Let's take the PW of an example. We figured out that the shocks that we create, these high density ramps that we create by the blocking foil become essential. Now we need to explore what is actually happening with all the different electrons that are within that simulation. There is no easy way to ask that question with a predefined plugin and, or yeah, with a predefined plugin. So you need some raw data output to study that and therefore develop a method to later on ask explicitly explicit questions for plugins or develop your own plugin to quantitate that specific question. And currently, well, up until recently, this required raw data to the disk. But if I have access to all that data right away, I can do this exploratory. I can have a look live into the visualization. I can ask the question, what is happening to the first down ramp electrons within these drugs? Do they get removed? Do they get refocused? All of that, that only comes up while you are actually exploring these simulations. So yes, I agree with you. In principle, it would be best to boil it down to a very limited output, but this is not always possible. So how do I look into 60 petabytes of data on your laptop? Um, 60 petabytes, I'm, the analysis I'm doing is not on my laptop. My laptop- For sure, yeah. But to, like you have your laptop here. How do you look at that? There are libraries to do Jupyter analysis on parallel data sets <coughs> that are actually supercomputer jobs. That so you're going to use some kind of reductions on these huge data sets and those compute for hours and days. If you have well distributed on a large system, this takes minutes. Mm -hmm. But you need, I mean, if you take a single core approach, you'll take hours, yes. How long does this data set take to generate? Pardon me? Like the 60 petabytes that you had as, as an example, like if, if you would run Ficon GPU to generate the bytes. Yeah, the large were a few petabytes because yeah. there's currently the, the other numbers are the overall data that, that are possible to handle, which we have to reduce by not only printing all. I just them. I just remember you had this number like 50 or 60 petabytes somewhere, and then you had like ah, this that's, exascale that's some global memory of all. Uh, that's the RAM memory of all. Ah, okay, okay. So I, just, I just recall the number. That you would need to do to analyze if you, for example, want to predict the radiation emitted in a post-processing way. Then you need all this data. Mm -hmm. But if you're saying, I'm, I'm not interested in a very fine resolved time evolution, for example, I only want to have a snapshot of my data or I want to have an update of the electric field distribution associated with all particle distributions at a specific time interval, then I can reduce this with that time interval, of course. Makes I sense. All so you're like the total data, like every time step you flush to the disk. That's impossible. insane. Okay. That's the insane number. So you already, you already take a reduced data set. Yeah, but not all data analysis can be reduced. So for example, mm -hmm. if you have a data analysis that requires a time integration with a fine sampling, Mm -hmm. You either go for disk option and wait forever, or you do it online. But if you do this kind of analysis, you, you already need to know how to generate your output of the simulation. Yes. Like there is not one generic output format that can serve all kind of analysis. There is. There is. Something. <laughs> so but that will be huge now. No, it will be huge, yes. But okay, let's say we have this. Uh, I think I have this slide on that. Yes. Um, so currently, this plugin worked within Pick on GPU and did the analysis within Pick on GPU on that Pick on GPU intrinsic data. That's how it worked so far. And this is fine and this is extremely fast, but this needs to be written in detail and isn't easily to be abstracted. 
Now we support this open PMD API, which has a given format for the output. So you stream it to your analysis script directly. And of course, this is a lot of communication. But I mean, in the end, uh, it never has to touch a disk. So you're, you're only dealing with bandwidth from your um, GPU to CPU communication in the best case. For example, you, you use the CPUs on each node. If you're computing on the GPUs, you click on GPU, you use either second GPU for the data analysis or the CPU cores for the data analysis. So you distribute your data analysis on the fly, but with this common interface of OpenPMD. But this is online. So while the simulation online. is running. While the simulation is running. So in my analysis script, I'll write that, I'll let that run, and then I figure, oh my God, I had a bug in there. Yes. I need to rerun the whole simulation as well. But this is easier than to run the simulation again after you filled up the entire file system. Because this is my initial question, like, do we ever need to dump something to disk? Like, why don't we run all analysis online? That would be cool, but currently you still... <laughs> Rene is... <laughs> yeah, Rene? Uh, yeah, I, I, I try to interrupt. Um, um, uh, because of the question, uh, uh, what is if the script is failing? Um, in, in, in the full uh, workflow we have in mind at the end, it could be your script is failing during the, you uh, run your observation and try to analyze the data on the fly, but this not means that the simulation is, is, is then crashing or something. If the script for the analyzing is failing, then you can still receive the data, but maybe your process, your, your, your plot you are, you are creating out of the data is wrong. Then you have for a few seconds, you steer the simulation during the just running uh, wrong data, but then you can correct your script on the fly. This would be uh, an ideal case later on. So, so with script failing, I meant I did a logic error, not, not like a crash or something, but like I miscalculate something. Like I, I forgot to square a variable in, in my code. But then if I, uh, if I changed it, I would already have missed some part of the simulation. But so I still would uh, need to redo that. But then, then you need to go to your boss and hope that he is <laughs> <Okay>. he's ni <laughs> nice enough that he, <laughs> because it's a lot of computing time you wasted. <laughs> But that's what we already do. I mean, the current output is already continuous. So we get updates from the simulation uh, in a regular basis and we check them on the fly while the simulation is running. Not as inter interactively as we wish right now, but this is already happening with the current setup and therefore you re easily realize, okay, I did something entirely wrong and my foil target explodes. Um, yes, and then you can stop the simulation before I Mm -hmm. This is but, but possible. Ho hope hopefully, you have not applied uh, only for the simulation time for one simulation. You should should test it before and uh, should have a high possibility that your larger runs then are passing. I mean, uh, I mean, one one of the critical things is here that current HPC systems are set up for batch processing. So you have a queue, you put in your work, you wait until that thing runs, and then data gets produced. This will change. And I tell you why it will change. Because we are currently running on the exascale systems. Mm -hmm. We're running on the ULIC systems. We're running on, on Summit and so on. And we get requests where they say, oh, tell us something about your I.O. workflow and how you do this. And, and what, what we're going to expect. And I'm saying, okay, I, sh I will show you what I want. So what I will do is I will run that code on the second largest system in the world and let it produce as much data as possible given the current bandwidth of their I.O. system. Mm -hmm. And I will show them this is not enough. This is maybe every hundred time step and I need every time step. Because Summit has, I don't know how much petabyte on hot disk, I don't care, I can fill this up in a few hours. And nobody else can use this system anymore. So what is currently the problem is that these systems operate in the wrong way. They simply don't understand that they need to get interactive. And this is something that they have to learn the hardware in order to, I just flood their file system to the max in a few hours and will tell them, 
that's our standard workflow. What's your so, what's your proposition to change that? So I have two conflicting ideas here because on on the one hand you say like the, the file system is limiting us and the stronger those those HPC system gets in computing power like the uh, I O does not scale equally. Exactly. So I see like writing to disk is not feasible and we are already super limited there. But on the other hand, like running on an HPC system is super expensive and it seems like I only get this one shot to run the simulation, capture all the data because that's all I have for the next five years. So I don't see how this can work out. I, I, I tell you how this can work out. One of the bad things about HPC systems currently is, or the way they operate is, as I say in batch mode, mm -hmm. and the other critical failure they have in mind mm -hmm. is that they have always been defined by capability simulations. Capability means I can use a considerable portion of the system so why, why should I buy an exascale system? Because it's a thousand times better than a petascale system, you know? Okay. And how do I justify this? Because we're going for simulations with 10 times more resolution in all, in all dimensions, for example. So we get much higher resolution, but still it's a single simulation. You know, it's a single simulation on a petascale system. And then I can scale this up by a factor of thousand and I can do much more now on an exascale system. That's called capability runs. <laughs> so it always means that I have to justify the next system by saying I can run a thousand times larger stuff on that. And of course, that's great to sell. That's the selling point for these mm -hmm. systems. But so many codes today can reasonably use petascale or sub petascale systems. And usually if you do this by batch mode, you would do this again and again and again, and that's called capacity computing. Capacity means I just use the capacity of a system to produce a lot of smaller scale simulations. So to my mind, actually an exascale system should also provide capacity by defining, I can run a hundred petascale simulations simultaneously, or I can provide 50 users the ability to rerun and, and interactively interact with that system at the same time, having enough free resources so that they need, that they, if they want to rescale, rest, uh, rescale or revisit some of their stuff, they can get the resources pretty quickly and there's no sharing conflict. Because if there's one large simulation, mm -hmm. Like pick and GPU. Do you know how hard it is to actually run on such a system when it's when it's very well used to run a full scale simulation? If I want to do this interactively, it usually it's very nice to be a European group on a on a US system for the very simple reason that you get more free time when it's dark in the US. Nah. Then the code runs, it's, it's, it's daytime here, and you can interactively look at the data. If you would be in the US, you would need to wake up at three o'clock in the night and look at your data. That's not a, that's not a way to operate. So that's a, I would say that's a cultural and historical phenomenon, not a technical one. <laughs> I'm still trying to, to, to grasp a bit, like, why, why do we flush data to disk? Why don't we repeat the simulations? Just like, like plug a new analysis or like with those plugins, like, like first like develop the analysis I want to have on my local machine, on my local cluster on the institute, like, like also do the explorative work on like my small scale simulations. And when I kind of understood the phenomenon and I perfected my analysis, then I'll do the super fine one on the cluster. I get the one run and I have super nice results. The problem is that, uh, that, the, that the simulations don't scale. Because this, the results are just too different yes. on my local machines? Yes. Okay, so it depends so much on like the domain resolution. The domain resolution, the, the dimensionality. So I, I think you showed this, that yeah. the 2D do not at all reflect the 3D simulations. For so for the uh, droplet simulations I showed you, the mm -hmm. three simulations were 2D because the 3D simulation was so expensive to only be run once. Mm -hmm. And this is of course an issue because, I mean, they simulated with 3D, the perfect shot realized, okay, this is pretty much changing the physics entirely. Mm -hmm. 
but we don't have compute time to actually simulate like a laser missing the droplet slightly, which would be more representative of what's actually happening in the experiment. Um, on the other hand, if you say, okay, I, I do all the modeling for LWFA, for example, with a pure Gaussian laser at low resolution, you're fine. And then your experimentalist tells you, our laser didn't look like that. We need to add a couple more, more modes, which will scale up your simulation, not by resolution, but by size, uh, because the transversal modes initially are much broader. Therefore, you increase rapidly in, in simulation volume, even if these modes are only contributing a slight part of the intensity, as you have seen, this dramatically changes how the laser self focuses and how injection happens. So yes, you can do <coughs> some the models, but they not always, or mostly do not represent what will actually happen in a full scale 3D simulation with real parameters. So I definitely need the big system to, to understand what's going on in my simulation. Yeah, and you need the big system to actually figure out what you just need to not actually understood from experiments, for example. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, it's not playing around with parameters on a small scale, and just scale it up and check whether what you predicted is right, but you need this big system to actually do your first predictions. But by the way, there is a very interesting, mm -hmm. interesting interconnection between making your code fast mm -hmm. and needing to run on larger scale system. You would first thing, think because you want to run a larger scale system, Due to the physics mm -hmm. that you could not do, you would make your code run fast to do that. It is actually the other way around. Because when we really want to go to a large scale system, the first thing that we need is simple memory. You know, memory, if I want to do more particles, more cells, I need yeah. more memory to fit, fit the system in. And if you look at the numbers that Richard showed in, the, in, the, uh, in his talk, I guess, and also on the development of how HPC systems have developed, the memory increase, so the overall memory that you can use, mm -hmm. is not the same as the compute power. So usually you get much more compute power these days, but only modest increase in overall memory that you can use fast memory. Fast memory in like the sense of, of caches. Yeah, no, caches, but also just the GPU memory, if you consider this fast, for example. If video memory didn't scale so good. I think RAM does okay, probably. RAM does not do okay because That's it's rather bad. expensive and, and those systems usually spend very little money on their RAM because it's so expensive and they want to get the flops, you know, the flops is the number. Yeah, that doesn't and they're show working at Again, it's a, it's a cultural issue. Also, also by the way, a mem um, an energy issue because memory is also uh, energy expensive. I, I don't know, actually. Yeah, it's quite, it's, it's quite expensive, actually, okay. in terms of memory. So, so the, uh, in terms of energy. So the really interesting part is mm -hmm. that if you want to do a larger system, even if you're quite fine with the speed of your code as it is, maybe mm -hmm. you can wait a week maybe you're well your phd goes three years who cares about two months of calculation time and actually to really use that kind of machine in a somewhat efficient way you are bound to optimize your code for parallelization to actually get access to enough memory mm -hmm. that's a very interesting development so you're forced by, by the simple rules on how to get to those machines that you can highly parallelize your code. But what you just want to do is have a 10 times bigger system. Usually it's 10 times or 20 times. It's not a thousand times bigger for the memory, but it will be a hundred times faster. That's a very funny thing that you get faster and faster results while the increase in overall system size is quite moderate mm -hmm. compared to that. Because you get so many transistors and so little memory. Interesting thought, yeah. 
And to answer your previous question, why are we still writing to disk? Mm -hmm. Because it is really strenuous for the mind of a person to work full time on analyzing this data in a quantitative manner. Explorative work can be done quite nicely, mm -hmm. but then really selecting it on, in a quantitative level, do a quantitative analysis. We are simply lacking the means as humans to do this on this scale in terms of concentration. Mm -hmm. Even if you develop a full tool set, really thinking about, I'm now in a hundred dimensional parameter space. How do I select this? How do I do this? You know, you do this for two hours and you're done. I, I understand. Yeah, you're simply done. So you need at some point to dump the data and then revisit it. Think about it, revisit it, think about it. And this is why so many people hope for AI and have so little idea that it won't help. <laughs> Because they have never done it. They have never done it on that scale. And they don't know what it means to decide on such a short time scale whether data is needed or not. You have so little time to answer that question, is that data relevant? And you have to reduce the data by factors of three orders of magnitude, four orders of magnitude. How do you do this if you have absolutely no clue in the beginning what's awaiting you? How do you tell the machine now cut away and only keep 0.01% of that data? That's the efficient one. I have literally no idea. That's not quite true, but uh, <laughs> everything I have doesn't give you these reduction times right now. So the particle physicists are really in a very happy place because they have understood how to cut data by five or six orders of magnitude without having to think about or ask anybody. And only because they spent 40 years trying to find what's ordinary and what's not. Exactly. And they, can, they have only one system to look at, a single system, and that's the vacuum. which is quite structured and they can look at it in a statistical manner and each of the events is independent of the others. These are three very strong requirements and one of the very, 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 very interesting problems here is that as soon as you have a particle physicist who did this for 40 years and they go to any other uh -huh field of research, they think, we have solved all these problems. Yes, under certain very strict conditions. Mm -hmm. Like, how would you feel if I come up to, to CERN every week, exchange the properties of the vacuum and all the detectors and the machine, and still ask you to do all of that? No, it wouldn't work because they like hard code so many assumptions in the code that's been there for 20 years. Like if they plug in a new detector, like a software team going to do archaeology for five years to get that work. Yeah. And that's what they're not getting, that, that this is the routine operation, for example, for a photon science facility. Mm -hmm. I see the point, yeah. So they want to resell all their things and I say, yeah, guys. <laughs> doesn't work with us. It doesn't work <laughs> like that. But, uh, can you go back to the open PMD? And did, did you get, by the way, the part on the reduction? Part on the reduction. So if you're applying compression algorithm. No, no, not just compression. Any form of reduction, yeah. throwing away stuff, doesn't matter. AI, doesn't matter. 
I mean, these are all looseless algorithms at that point. Lossless. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Doesn't matter. That even that graph is not just true for loss lossless. It's also for lossy. That paper sucks. I hate that paper because it's wonderful. <laughs> it tells you a universal truth that is really hard to grasp. It tells you, so these different curves are for different compression ratios or for any ratio of how much data you throw away the thing. compared to what you need. Okay, because they are like compression technologies. Yes. I see C-Lib or yes. C-Studio. These are just Those compression, are like but that could also be just sampling, throw every hundred thing away or yeah. whatever you do. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some form of compression ratio or, or reduction ratio. So 1.0 means nothing. 0.1 means you have 90% thrown away. 0.01 and so on and so on. And as you see, as you throw much more stuff away or compress much more, you can you go lower with that curve. Mm -hmm. And lower and lower, but not much actually anymore. 0.1 is already pretty good. 0.01 gives you another one. 0.0, but it's not like going going to zero very quickly or whatever. So it will move that curve down. And the only time you really get better is when you go under that dashed line, that straight black dashed line. That's when you will increase your data throughput. And you have to increase your data throughput because usually you would operate in a situation where you already use your max throughput because that's what you're optimizing for okay so this gamma ratio has to be below one so this means in order to really get sensible throughput you have to really compress strongly mm -hmm. by either throwing away or doing a hard compression or whatever now here's a very dirty secret if you're having a very high compression ratio, who knows what Shannon entropy and other things are, you know, and the information in the data has a high redundancy if you can throw a lot of stuff away. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of, if you can throw a lot of stuff away or if you can compress to something very small, the initial information in that is very limited. You know, that means actually whenever I can do this, I have either very well understood what small part of the data is interesting while the rest is really boring. That's the particle physics approach, the small X bump overall is background. Or the information in the initial data is very low. And now we come back to exascale com computing or petascale computing and to the to the things that Richard told you today. Once you do this, and once you go to large real scale simulation, think of simulating the whole weather on Earth with a one meter resolution for the next 10 days mm -hmm. you know something like that or or the the spread of COVID 19 on a on a scale of humans of all the 4.5 billion humans and, or how many are we now 10 i don't care anymore it doesn't matter you know 9 10 it doesn't matter it's inconceivable mm -hmm. And the interesting part is because you can make the systems larger, there are few, few exceptions like for example, lattice QCD. We don't talk about lattice QCD. But everything that would really make sense to use in such a large scale system will increase the complexity and thus the information content. 
So while we are aiming to, to create actually more interesting scientific information, at the same time we're creating systems where I am not able to sustain the throughput for this data, whatever I do. So that's, by the way, why everybody is so happy to have lattice QCT people, because their information that they finally produce is so tiny. They don't have an I.O. problem at all. And they can scale to the largest machines ever, because their they're, they're, uh, scaling is highly linear and everything is fine. So if you have a, you always phone up the QCD people first, because you will never run into that problem. Because the information they're producing can, can still be going on a, on a, a five and a half inch disk or something, a floppy disk, while, while the computation, boom, goes like that. Exactly. So I wonder why don't we make our simulations more like those? Because our simulations are fundamentally different. Our information is in these highly complex nonlinear details. Mm -hmm. Of course, I can get you a lot of highly reduced information, but it won't help me to solve the problem I'm looking for. It absolutely won't help you because to me that statistical information is useless since it smears out all the effects that I'm actually interested in. My question is different than theirs. Mm -hmm. That's why my answer is different. And that's why I'm running into this problem. That's true, but then I also think like, that this is, this is like one IO channel that you have, but fundamentally another IO channel is the one that goes into your brain. Like mm -hmm. also like you looking at renderings, images, graphs, like that takes time as well. So like if the simulation ran an hour and produces data and it takes you two years to look at the data, <coughs> no need for a simulation that runs this fast. The simulation could have produced the data steadily over two years. You cannot absorb this fast enough in your brain as well. Very good point. But isn't this where you, I mean, you generate lots of simulation data, but then you also want to, you can map that back into analytical expressions. Like thinking in terms of like a serious expansion for a function, right? And you have coefficients that you could, right? Couldn't you, although this is producing petabytes of data, but in the end, you could imagine you're interested in one property and you could have a, an analytical expression, a serious expansion of this property. And all the simulation data is just computing these coefficients, right? So is one, of one the, way of reducing data? The, yes. One of the things that you can easily do is ensemble simulations. So usually in these kind of simulations, you do not take a single simulation with a single set of inputs, but you actually run the same simulation with a variation in the inputs and look at this like a statistical ensemble mm -hmm. because it fits your experimental paper uh, input parameters, including your uncertainties, or for example, it somewhat samples the breadth of possible of solution space you're actually looking at. For example, you only have the limited capabilities in ramping up the, the laser power or making the spot smaller or larger of your laser mm -hmm. or increasing uh, plasma density or decrease. So there are limits to that. And if you can, them, can run all of them at the same time, what you can, of course, do is not just show a single simulation. For example, you can show the average and the variation. That's a different way of looking at a single simulation, but rather at an ensemble. But one of the fundamental things that, that you are speaking of is not so much that you can slow down things again, because that's not happening. That's not how these systems operate. That's not, there, there must be a fundamental change in using these things. I call them then discovery machines, because that's what they need to be in the future. But one of the fundamental things is that the human 
using these must be thought as a highly unreliable asynchronous resource within that system. It must, the human interactions must be included in the scheduling of these things. Yes. That's a funny way to look at it. Because nobody includes the human currently as a resource in an HPC system, but that's what's going to happen. It's the same as, a, as an autonomous car, by the way. Because as long as the car is running by itself, everything is fine. As soon as the human does anything stupid, uh, everything is not fine. So the situation where you have everything under control, including your environment, is much better and much easier than if you still have interaction by those stupid, asynchronous, unreliable resources, you know. That's the challenge here. That's the big challenge because if you really want to have fast decrease of data and fast, fast decrement of data, at some point and in some way, this expert knowledge must go into the system to achieve this. Or AI will do everything, which of course it won't. So yes, you have touched the central point on why we have a problem. And I don't have an easy answer to that. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. I have some answers to that, by the way. For example, if you go to the open PMD thing, annotating your whole simulation and all the parts of it and also the, the, the analysis and the storage and everything, as a an, as an complex system interacting with each other by a standard API that describes all the data that can actually be meaningfully stored or interchanged in a single way will make this system much more robust and much more um, interactive in a sense because you can now plug in things that you Previously, you can change your workflows. You can make them more interactive because yeah. wherever something comes out and in again, it will be the same format. Now, if I have, if I have a live visualization like Isaac, mm -hmm. now I can give feedback. Here's my finger. I draw with my finger around those electrons that I'm interested in. Because everything is open PMD, and Isaac is seeing this as open PMD, I can re-go there and say, okay, now I'm giving this input, for example, to IO and saying just the area that I selected should actually go to IO, for example, by saying now, or do it now. Right? This is already a lot of reduction. Of course, I can have intelligent algorithms running in the back so they see what I'm doing, what I'm doing repeatedly, maybe rather a set of simulations, mm -hmm. and they can guess based on my input and what I'm doing with the data Might be interesting. on what I'm doing and learning from my actions. And then the next time they can make a suggestion saying, I've seen you select those particles over and over again for the last five minutes, telling me that this is something interesting. Maybe this is something interesting for you. How, how about that selection? And then you say, fine, great that you did this, but there you have to change it a bit. You know, there you got wrong, there you got wrong. And we do this like for 10 minutes or so, with maybe one simulation in a set of 100, because that's the statistically typical one. And hopefully whatever I have set up has learned enough from my interactions with that system to easily deploy this selection to all the other ones. That's a huge reduction with a very limited way of interacting with the data actually. Mm -hmm. And then I can still decide to, to also write statistically relevant full data sets in between, not at high resolution, but saying, okay, because you might later want to revisit some of that stuff, because 
you were wrong, I can still give you a few snapshots to compare whether later on you were right or not. Still a huge reduction. And then hopefully at some point I can say, oh, forget about this, go back. And then maybe I have steps in between to say, oh, I can go back 10 times steps, 100 times steps, 1,000 times steps, because I had these snapshots and we start. Oh, that was wrong. And what I interact with is not the data, but the visualization of the data. So maybe if the visualization is a reduction of the data already, because we get the numbers of particles, 10 trillion particles, even if we have a wall of 8K LED TVs, there won't be enough pixels to show all of them. You know, it doesn't make sense to have that. Mm -hmm. So my visual representation is already a, a strong reduction of what I'm seeing. So maybe if I go back, I'm not going back over the data set, but just over its highly reduced reduction. So it lo looks really like I'm going back on a full movie with all the steps in between. And then I'm going maybe a hundred steps before the next uh, snapshot of the old simulation. And then my simulation tells me, okay, when you want to go there, I have to redo another hundred time steps. Wait for me for two, three minutes, get a coffee. I'll be back with you in a few seconds. But the interaction is seamlessly. So these are the kind of things that you can do, showing you averages, showing you deviations from averages. That's something that's happening on a human scale. And in principle, such a design allows for that. But you know how much work that, that actually entails. But it would be a wonderful thing to have, of course. But I think you really have to to, to differentiate between understanding the data for the first time and selecting which parts might be interesting for later. And by this, in a fast and timely manner of a few hours, maybe days, reach a high reduction. And then later on, save that for later revisiting on a much longer time scale of a few months, two years. I think that's a reachable and sensible workflow that you can do. Anything else is, to my best understanding of the current situation, absolutely impossible. Or you fully understand your data and just can, can just do it automatically anyway. But then you're, then it's boring, you know, then we have solved <laughs> this already. Probably, yeah because that's the particle physics guys. Then they can come up and say, partially we... <laughs> we should want to measure some numbers more precisely. Exactly. So we know what's going to happen. Exactly. So let's build that system, by the way. Let's actually build that system. I'm busy for the next three years. You gave me something else to work on. <laughs> I, I think you're part of that bigger picture. Probably, maybe. <laughs> Out of the little square. <laughs> Everybody's a little square. <laughs> so I have a tangential question. So would it make sense to simulate just particle simulations on Bitcoin GPU or use Bitcoin GPU to do just MD like simulations without any fields? And um, if you have Something like that, uh, atom atom interaction. What, what, would, what would make sense is to take Pick on GPU apart, and that's what we're currently working on, and providing the sensible modules to do simulations like yours to formulate them with the toolbox of Pick on GPU, or let it be. Uh, Open FPM or whatever. Yeah. I mean, to basically develop such a toolbox that it makes it possible to define a nice particle and cell simulation, but maybe also a very nice pure MD simulation or an FEM simulation. That makes sense, but this is first, this is a 
strong endeavor in terms of understanding how this must be taken apart and how this must be recombined. You know, what are the building blocks of that? And usually you do it wrong. So there's a very high chance you're, you're, you're dismantling the radiant when, when you put it back again, there's no bicycle coming out of that, whatever you do. Is what you really need to do is put it into its atomic consistent consist, constituents and then build a bicycle out of that or a, or a chocolate cake. It's like <laughs> your your scale of what a building block is is very important in how diverse your final solution can be. But of course, as you reduce those blocks, many more can interact with each other, which makes the interfacing much more problematic. And the usability of each of these building blocks is very limited. Sometimes it's also widened, but really, think of every building block has to be maintained by somebody. It's a problem. This is why there are so many research grants and so many research institutes doing the same stuff all, all over again. Because it's all a, it's all a, it's all an endeavor in, in finding the right granularity for the final solution. <laughs> That's a problem because you only have limited time. But, 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 I mean, in terms of your question, this, I mean, I asked this earlier, com comparing PIC with MD, I thought maybe PIC is a coarse grained version of MD in a certain sense. No, Unfor unfortunately, the particles in PIC are not the same particles in MD. In MD, they're really real particles. In PIC, from the algorithmic point of view, not generally from the framework, but from the algorithmic point of view, they are cut out of the Boltzmann distribution. So they're phase, uh, they're not really phase space elements, they're something in between phase space elements and real particles, because they're not spread out in, in, in usually in uh, momentum, but just in space. So they are their distributions, you can force them. So they're more quantum mechanics. Than no, 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 not at all. They're just a, they're just a statistical, they're, they're a sample point. They're a sample point in your phase space and they can almost interact like real particles and you can make them look like real particles and you can actually get close to an MD simulation. But you can do, for example, and that's one of the things that you can do, is, for example, go to a non-relativistic case, use the Coulomb force, develop a PIC algorithm for that, including binary collisions and full force calculation within the, within the cells, and then get close to what an MD algorithm with, would do if you are not really strongly coupled. Meaning that, the, that you can make a um, differentiation of scales because what the cell does is basically, it gives you a, 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 a scale, a gauge, at which you can make a cut between a, 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 a medium, um, long range interaction or, or uh, not, not long range interaction in that sense, but, but uh, so to say neighbor interaction where you can summarize over many interactions and local interaction in which you really need to encounter the details. If you can describe your system in such a way, a pick like algorithm makes sense. Then you can also take these particles and make them behave like real particles. But unfortunately, many of the systems we're interested in do not have that scale difference. If you have it, fine, then you can do it because then you basically say the cell is the distance at which um, 
small scale interactions don't matter anymore and I can just assume an average way of interacting. Three algorithms, um, uh, fast multipole methods, particle mesh algorithms, and they all fall into this case where I can have some form of parameter devising small and large scale. And then you can do it, of course, but you're missing critical dynamics depending on how your system will evolve. For example, if you're looking at, a, at the local Coulomb energy, Pick will never give it to you in a dense plasma. It, is, it will always smooth out everything, and since the Coulomb potential is uh, 1 over R, any smoothing will give you considerable deviations from the actual distribution. Whatever you do, you can throw as many particles in as you want. Getting an accurate result will, all, will be very hard. By the way, even if you take more macro particles than real particles, you can do that doesn't change a thing, single thing. It's a bit more accuracy, not much. That's why usually the, the binary collisions over using average quantities will probably re for, for situation for equilibrium situations will produce more accurate results than the full up emission model. Is the full up emission models have a lot of noise in the sample that will not exist if you average over average. And if you're then in an equilibrium situation, the equilibrium state is close to the average state. And this means it will be highly accurate. While any sampling of that state basically can be anywhere and usually will have a lot of noises in between that you don't really want. But that's just sampling. Sampling sucks. It has its applications. It has its applications. But think of this one sampling set for one parameters needs the largest, that needs the top 10 supercomputers. That's extremely poor sampling. <laughs> That's true. I can, I can easily go to, to, to Oak Ridge and say, hey, I need Summit for the next three years and I have good reasons because I need to have statistic sampling of my, of my input space. Can I have this full system for the next three years? By the way, you brought way too, too little disk here. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions on problems of sampling and data reduction? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want to be negative, but I have been thinking about this for quite some time. <laughs> I don't have an easy solution to it.